Okay, so quick introductions. Adrian Murray from Hamilton & Co. in New Westminster and Veronica Franco from Clark Wilson in Vancouver. Um, both are going to do presentations. I just realized that today is June 22nd, not June 15th, but that seems to be at the top of the slide to make it entertaining for everyone. So uh, there we go. Uh, our sponsor this week for our sessions, which run through to the end of September, by the way, is Associa Property Management. Um, so thanks very much to Associa for their sponsorship. Uh, again, privacy reminder, please submit your questions through Q&A and do not identify any personal information from your strata corporation or yourself. Uh, so here we go, Adrian, there, it's all over to you. Thanks, Tony, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, election of Strata Council. Uh, one of the things, I mean, it's, it's one of the items in, in the agenda for a meeting, um, but it can be actually one of the more contentious, and it's at the end of the meeting, um, which is usually when people are starting to get tired and perhaps a bit cranky. And so no, having it having the practice down, having the process down, knowing exactly how this is supposed to run um, is going to make your meeting much smoother and will bring it to a conclusion, hopefully um, much quicker. So one of the first things you do, and the work really begins before the meeting. So as you're preparing for the AGM, it's important to actually take a minute and review the bylaws. So we have standard bylaws, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but many strata corporations, well, many, there are strata corporations, perhaps not many, but there are strata corporations that have amended the bylaws in relation to strata council. So how many council members does your bylaw, do your bylaws permit? Who may qualify to be a council member? Does your bylaw say anything about spouses of owners or um, accountants or children of owners, anyone else who could be considered to be um, another class of people. Um, the term of the council members, again, we've got some bylaws that indicate that the term is two years. Is that what your bylaw says? And if so, which council members are within that um, re-election period and which have still another year to go, who have another year to go? And are there any procedures? And you'll see, I think by the end of this morning, that actually preparing some procedures, if this is particularly an issue in your strata and including those procedures is not a bad idea. Now, in addition to looking at your bylaws, an important thing to figure out is whether you've got your owner's list up to date. So in order to actually have a complete and accurate owner's list, you need to search the title of every strata lot. And at some point you may do, you may need to do that if things are unclear or the information was not properly retained by perhaps a previous strata council or strata manager. Ideally, once you get it updated, then all you need to do is just check it for any changes that, have may, that may have occurred during the year. And you'll know those changes by the issuance of Form Fs. So if the title has changed, the strata has to issue a Form F. So a good place to start is, did we issue any Form Fs? One of the common issues I see is, is an owner's list will refer to Mary and Bob Smith but the title is only in the name of Bob Smith. And that's gonna be important because if Mary wants to vote, Mary needs a proxy. And if Mary wants to stand for council, Mary's gonna need, um, you're gonna need a bylaw that permits spouses. So um, if you're uncertain about your, about your uh, owner's list, it's a good idea to simply um, search the titles. If you're in a large strata, maybe you want to search um, a few, you know, 20 every year and just make sure that it's brought up to date. Now, um, council basics. The number of council members um, is determined, as I've said, in the bylaws. And the standard bylaws says between three and seven. Now, interestingly, there was a case where the owners got to the meeting and said, well, no, our bylaws say three to seven, but we really think six is a better number. So at the, at the time for the election of the Strata Council, they wanted to restrict it to six. The CRT um, said that that wasn't valid. 
because in order to restrict it to six, you need to actually amend the bylaws. You need to have a three quarter vote resolution that amends the bylaws. That resolution then needs to be filed. The bylaw amendment resolution needs to be filed in the land title office to show that the bylaws have changed. So while it says between three and seven, that's, that's a range that your bylaws permit, but you can't actually limit it to uh, a number less than seven at the meeting. Now, Section 28, as I've indicated, or as we've talked about, determines who can be a council member, but the strata can change that. And many, many stratas now are including spouses of owners to be on title. And that, that covers off that situation where the title is in the name of one or the other of the, of the spouses, but the other spouse really wants to participate and, and be on council. So it's an, it's an easy, it's an easy um, change to make. One of the things I do recommend though, is if you're gonna permit spouses on, on council, I have some that permit children to be on council, I usually include with the permission of the owner. Because what you don't wanna do is get caught between um, warring spouses or spouses that are separated. And if it says a spouse of an owner and um, the spouse um, that actually owns the or the owner doesn't want their spouse on title, uh, you have no means to control that. So it could get a little bit unpleasant for the council. You don't want to be caught in that. So just include in your bylaw spouses of owners with the written permission of the owner. And um, it's, it's simple. Um, you can also um, add in, and I've seen professional advisors or accountants I've seen lawyers, but I don't recommend that. It's not always the, the ideal thing to have lawyers on council, but that you may have a complicated strata that, that um, requires it. So think through when you're looking at your bylaws, who should be on council? Who's going to be the most appropriate? Remember, the strata council is not unlike a board of directors. They're there to run the um, business of the strata corporation and in very complicated and complex stratas, having a, a broad and diverse group of people on council could well be a benefit. So now eligibility, uh, or sorry, how many council members do we elect? Sorry, we just thought we just looked at that. Strata count, how many council members Okay, basics, how many council members do we elect? Thank you, Tony. Um, as I've said, three to seven. And if you have fewer than four lots or four owners, then everyone's on council. And you can always amend the bylaws to establish different numbers um, entirely up to the council. Many, many stratus corporations stick with the, the standard bylaw. So eligibility. Now, um, the registered owner are the people who are on title. So that's what I said at the beginning. The, the way to know for sure who your eligible voters are is by searching the title. And the title may have one name, it may have many names. Those will all be um, registered owners eligible to be on title. So in some cases you may have um, mom and dad with a 99 out of 100th interest and a son who has a one one hundredth interest. The son is just as eligible to be on council as mom or dad. Um, a tenant who's been assigned an owner's right under section 147 of the act, that assignment has to be provided to the strata council. So if, an, and it doesn't need to be a long-term tenant, it could be a short-term tenant. So if, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> if the um, landlord has assigned their rights to a tenant and, the, and um, the tenant attends the meeting and, and the assignment includes the right to stand for council. As long as the, the landlord and the strata lot owner have provided that assignment to the council, then the tenant is perfectly eligible to be elected to council. Corporate representatives, I find this interesting. If a strata lot is owned by a corporation, then the corporation can appoint a representative to act um, in the in the shoes of the corporation. But if you have a corporation that owns a strata lot, how do you know who the person would be that can represent the company? And in this case, I recommend that the strata council advise the corporate owners that they must either provide um, 
a corporate search that shows that the individual um, is a director, or they have a resolution from the board of directors appointing this person to represent the corporate interests. So with a corporation, all, all the title is going to show us is the name of the corporation. And in those cases, in my view, the strata council has to go further to find out who actually is a proper representative of that corporation. And then that representative may be elected to council. And then other people, as I've indicated, um, if the bylaws permit it. Term of council is that the elected strata council members term ends at the end of the next annual general meeting. So the concept in the act is that the term of the strata council is one year. They're elected at the meeting and their um, term continues on. It continues on through the AGM through the next AGM and at the end of the AGM is when they, um, their term is up. Now there are bylaws that, as I said, have created a term of two years. And usually what the idea here is that they want continuity and some overlap. So we'll elect four members of council for a two year term the first year and three for one year. And then um, the next year we can start alternating so that we've got them running for two year terms um, and electing only half of the council members, sort of half of the council members each year. I haven't seen any um, CRT decisions on that and I, I have talked to other lawyers who have a mixed view. Um, I think that if you look, my view is if you look at section 25 of the act, it requires the corporation to elect a council at each annual general meeting. But I don't see that as saying electing the entire council. So to me, there's still an argument to say, as long as we elect some members of council each year, we've complied with section 25. Um, I'm not going to predict how the CRT would, would find that, but that would at least be my argument. If, if you've got a strata corporation that is determined to have that uh, to your term for its council members. Clearly the easiest and, and one that's absolutely in compliance with the act is to have that term expire um, at the end of the AGM and elect a new council each year. Now, <clears throat> nominations. The, sorry. Business of a strata corporation is determined um, under the bylaws or the standard bylaw 28, which includes the election of council. And so one of the things that you're going to do as you're preparing for this meeting is look at your agenda and make sure that your agenda of the meeting matches the bylaws because you do have an um, order of business for general meetings in the bylaws. If it's, either, if it's not in the bylaw amendments that you have, there's one in the standard bylaws. Included in that is the election of council. Now, any eligible voter can nominate another owner um, or corporate representative or spouse, depending on who's permitted. As well, in my view, owners can nominate themselves. They're eligible voters and they can indicate that they stand for council. So you can have people nominating or you can have individuals agreeing to stand for council. If somebody who's being nominated is not there, then you're going to want to know that they have confirmed their nomination, that they agree. <laughs> to be created by those who happen not to attend the meeting and those are the ones that got um, voted in and elected to be the council. So for goodness sakes, if you've got someone nominated who isn't in attendance, um, hopefully somebody's had a chat with them first, they've had um, confirmation that they're willing to stand. And if you don't have that, then in my view, you can't nominate them because we would end up with a situation where owners are being nominated, they're voted on, other people are being denied the right to be on council. And then after the meeting, the individual says, oh no, I have no desire to be on council. Um, we've, we've just dis disentitled a number of people who would be very willing to sit as a consequence on council. So um, make sure that you've got that confirmation. 
Now, the election of counsel, um, in my view, the process for the election is clearly set out under Section 50. Matters are decided by majority vote unless a different voting threshold is contained in the Act. And, and that applies to all the decisions at a general meeting unless we know that there's a, a different threshold. So special levies and uh, bylaw approvals and significant changes in appearance of common property, those all require three quarter vote. But the other decisions, approval of a budget, for example, and the election of council all require a majority vote. So how do we do that with um, the election of the council? Well, in my view, there's two options. At an annual meeting, um, at one of the options is a majority vote of all of those nominated. So on the next screen, we see the, the two um, options set out. A majority vote of those nominated if the number does not exceed the maximum number. So often you'll find we have five or six, maybe if we're lucky, we've got seven people that are willing to run for council. We can effectively elect them as a slate. I wouldn't call that acclamation per se, but I would say it's an electing them collectively. So the strata chair can call for a motion to elect the um, group of seven individuals as the council for the coming year. It's seconded, we take a majority vote. If there's a majority vote, this group of people, the seven, these seven people are now your strata council. Alternatively, we can ask for a majority vote for each member um, to be elected. So we can elect them collectively or we can elect them individually. And um, if we elect them individually, then we see that we I'm in a majority vote. Each eligible voter is entitled to one ballot. <clears throat> they can elect up to seven positions from that ballot. Um, nominees may not be duplicated. So I can't, I can't write down Mary Smith seven times and think that Mary Smith is going to get seven votes. I'm entitled to one vote per person. I can choose to vote for seven people or I can choose to vote for any less than seven people but they all need to be different. And then the total number of ballots will determine the majority requirement for election. Ballots may be submitted in a paper format for in-person meetings or electronically by emailed ballots or an electronic ballot process um, where the eligible voters are identified and qualified. So it's obviously more tricky with electronic meetings, our regular meetings where we know we're um, we have a paper ballot, people fill in the ballot by secret ballot and drop it in a box. Um, I have actually done meetings where we've elected individuals individually, elected council members individually, and not done it by secret ballot. And we've just done it by poll on, a, on in an electronic meeting. So if no one asks for a secret ballot, it's quite possible that we could run the entire strata council election and elect individuals um, with, without the need for secret ballot. But for many people, I think they feel this is more of a sensitive matter. It's um, more of a personal matter and secret ballots are, are often requested. So either electronically or in paper, but that's essentially our, our process. When we're talking, before <clears throat> I talk about this, when we're talking about whether we should vote by slate or by individual, one of the questions that has come up is whether, who makes that decision? And certainly there has been some view by individual owners um, that that should be a decision of the ownership. Um, I disagree. The uh, decision in terms of procedures at a meeting are determined by the strata council. So it's a matter for council procedure. Now, um, a majority vote to elect those councils 
who've been nominated and those council members would each require a majority of ballots. So the idea of a majority vote is just simply that, it's a majority of the ballots. Um, we have an example here. We have a maximum of three, maximum of seven and a minimum of three people on council. 11 council members are nominated, 71 ballots are cast representing 71 votes. So each owner is going to need a majority vote, 36 votes. Five council members are elected with at least 36 or more votes. So in this case, we don't elect the full seven. It isn't automatically seven. It's the number of individuals that have received a majority vote. And this can, can be applied in the event that there are seven or fewer. So whether it's 11 or whether it's seven or six, those individuals that get a majority vote are elected to council. And even with six members, you may find that um, an individual doesn't, in using this example, doesn't receive 36. You may have, if we have six owners running and we have 71 ballots, we may have five that receive um, 38, 39, 40 votes, more than 40. And we may have one of them that receive only 10 votes. So the fact that the number was under the maximum doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be on council when we run the method of election on an individual basis. So that's, that's important to recall. And that's um, one of the things or one of the ways to elect the council. And then the next issue I think is proxies. So do you want to ask, do we have any questions on council election or should yeah. we wait till the end? Actually, there, there's one good question that I think a lot of mixed use stratas probably experience. Um, and, and it's the bylaws that require where you have commercial residential require that the one commercial representative must be elected to council. Um, and so the question is really, how do you elect that person? So if you apply the majority vote rule, what if they don't get a majority of the votes to be elected? Um, but then the other side is what happens if we don't, if no one is willing to do it and we don't elect that position, does that mean the strata corporation can fill that position with another person? So it, it really, you know, it, it takes out, it contradicts section 28 of the act that defines who all the eligible people are for council, um, but then it stipulates that you must have one person from the commercial section um, represented on council. Um, can you comment on that? Because well, I know it's a complicated problem. Well, it, it is complicated. And um, unfortunately, <clears throat> pardon me, the CRT has not made it any easier these days because we have a case that goes back, I don't know, maybe a year. It's called Maruk Super PTY. And in that situation, it was a mixed use strata and the bylaws required somebody from, uh, I think it was the hotel, um, to be a representative on council. And the CRT looked at that and said, this does not comply with section 50 of the act, which requires that each council member is um, elected by majority vote. So where we, where we run a council, every position is there um, and needs to be elected by majority vote and nobody has a, a safe route onto council. Um, so it calls into question the very nature of a bylaw that says one of the council members is automatically on count, is automatically gonna be a commercial owner. Um, there's a more recent decision called Beale that said it's okay to have a bylaw that says council may, is made up of four townhouse members and three apartment members. And they didn't see that that was contrary to the act, but they didn't consider the Maruk decision. So in my view, um, I think the Maruk is the better decision. And so the very validity of that bylaw, I think is subject to question that requires a commercial owner. But having said that, here we are today, we're going into our meeting, we have this bylaw and the commercial owner does not attend. Does that leave the um, extra space vacant? Well, I, you know, 
the app doesn't doesn't assist us on this and if the bylaws don't say anything uh it's a flip of the coin quite honestly i don't think there's i think if nobody's there to be elected then that's a vacant position i would argue that it could be filled by um a non-commercial owner um what if the commercial owner doesn't get the majority vote well um too bad i think if the commercial owner is there and runs for council the commercial owner is basically gets a free pass which was the issue in Marouk. so um how you deal with it in the short term in the immediacy i think is uh if they're there they're going to be on council and if they don't show up well then i think it's a vacant position because once that meeting is over we can't start appointing people who um to vacant positions the only time we can appoint a person to a vacant position is where somebody has resigned so um again and maybe i should mention this i've seen strata council say or that well we had our meeting we have between three and seven permitted on council only four people were elected so at our first council meeting we're going to appoint three more people it doesn't work that way if four people were elected then four people were elected end of story and I think that the same um, would apply to the commercial owner. If he wasn't elected and didn't come to the meeting, I don't see how the Strata Council could now appoint the commercial owner uh, to attend. Okay, super. Um, we'll go over to proxies with Veronica, um, and but we'll come back because there's lots of questions and um, many of them were answered through the presentation, but there are a few others that we'll capture on you. So Veronica, proxies. Don't you just love them? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, it's funny. One of the things that I think the, I think proxies have been an issue for a long time, but um, I think what the pandemic has done and the CRT has done is sort of really be able to bring it to a focus and really think about it uh, in light of what we've had to deal with in terms of the number of holding meetings when we can't all be together in a room and using proxies. So uh, when we're talking about proxies, the starting point is always section 56 of the act. And it's a one little section, but there's a lot to unpack out of that section uh, when it comes to thinking about proxies. So section 56 sets out all of the requirements. It says that the proxy document has to be in writing and it has to be signed by the appointing owner. It can be revoked at any time. And we know that employees of the Strata Corporation and the Strata Manager cannot be proxies or cannot, yeah, cannot be proxies. The proxy uh, must be allowed all of the powers the Strata lot owner would normally hold in the meeting unless expressly limited in the proxy document. So you can limit their powers in the proxy document. So if you think about what they can do in a, what a, a your owner who's able to vote can do in the meeting, which is um, do amendments, or uh, move amendments, they can participate in the discussion and they can vote um, and they can be elected to, they can be nominated to the council. So those, um, those are the things that uh, your proxy document um, can, uh, uh, can, you can limit them if it's specified in the proxy document. So the next slide, okay. There we go. So, um, so we have the Strata Property Act has, um, and the regulations have forms. So that's where you can find blank form Vs, blank, um, and all, all other forms. The form A is the simple template for a proxy form. So it, uh, it's an optional form. It's actually one of the only optional forms in the regulations. And that means that Strata corporations aren't required to use that form. Um, but what's great about it is that there you have a document that actually uh, we know complies with the requirements under Section 56. So uh, it's a fantastic starting point. And while you're permitted to include a copy of a proxy in or a blank proxy form in the notice package, Section 45 of the Act actually doesn't require one to be included. So I've seen both. I've seen lots of strata corporations who have always included a blank proxy form. Um, I, I feel like you see that a lot in strata corporations where they have a lot of trouble 
getting people to come to the meetings. So they send out a blank proxy form asking people to submit proxies if they can't attend, submit a proxy. Um, and then we've got lots of other ones that don't at all uh, include uh, blank forms. And both of them are entirely appropriate. Next slide. Er. Right, so we've now actually had as a result of this sort of coming together of the pandemic and the CRT, we've had a number of CRT decisions that have talked about sort of do's and don'ts about um, proxies. So we've got a few decisions that tell us specifically that you can't, uh, can, you can't require that the owner provide their proxy only to a specified uh, uh, people to be on proxy. So what you've seen is um, proxy forms that say it can only be a council member, choose one of the council members, or it can only be a specific person, choose only that person. Those are not uh, permitted. You can't require them to only pick certain people. So you're not permitted to limit or restrict the assignment or use of the proxy. So and we've got a number, actually, those, all those, those uh, two decisions both say the same thing with respect to proxies. The next slide. So you can't require that the proxy be granted only limited or restricted powers such that the proxy cannot propose amendments or participate. An owner has the option to grant their power, or their proxy, full proxy powers. Now, I think one of the difficulties with um, this decision is that we also have section 56. And in one of the decisions, um, the CRT acknowledges that section 56 actually allows the proxy giver, I'll call them, the proxy giver to limit uh, the powers that the proxy holder, the proxy person who's attending uh, can have. So you actually can restrict their powers. The problem was in a lot of these cases as these were done all in the context where the Strata Corporation provided a very specific proxy form and the suggestion was, this is the only proxy form that's permitted. We're only doing it this way. And so the owner would not have had the option or did not feel like they would have the option to provide full proxy powers. And, um, and that's what uh, the problem was with many of these decisions. So it's entirely possible for the owner to say, no, you, you don't have the power to um, propose amendments or participate just to vote in the manner that I've provided, but that has to be owner initiated rather than strata corporation initiated or strata council initiated. So, sorry, can we go back track? Uh, so um, the other, yes, thanks. The other issue that comes up, and again, you have to remember that all of this was sort of happening in the context of uh, not being able to meet in person and having, I hate to use the word, but having what has become known as restricted proxy meetings um, where, uh, where people were forced to use or were told that they had to use uh, these specific proxy forms. Uh, one of the issues that comes up now, uh, now that I think people have I come to realize, yeah, yeah, we have to move on beyond that. We're now having uh, meetings that are, are using proxies and people show up with a bunch of proxies is registration. And registration always, whenever you, whether it's in person or online, when you have a lot of people with holding proxies, it takes a lot longer because you're having to certify each of those proxies. Um, and so one of the things that um, strat some strata corporations have done with respect to the online meetings or the vir virtual meetings is that they have requested that the proxies be provided in advance. And the CRT has said, that's fine as long as it's not mandatory. So you can't require them to provide it in advance. They can show up um, and provide it just at the meeting. And as long as you're, uh, you're doing it only for organizational purposes. And let me explain what organizational purposes means. That is to essentially to facilitate um, the certification of the proxy. So that's it. Once the proxy is certified, you are treating that proxy like you would at an in-person meeting. So that the organizational purposes does not count counting the votes on the proxy if the proxy has directed how to vote. Um, you still have to call the vote and the proxies still have to vote 
And by and that's the, the person holding the proxy, they are attending the meeting, just like you would in an in-person meeting, and they are voting on behalf of the owner who granted them the proxy. So, which goes to the second, it goes to the point on this slide, which is don't use the form proxy form as a ballot. A proxy form appoints the proxy. So if you read section 56, you come to realize that the proxy is not the piece of paper that you um, that you hand in the, or, or have certified. The proxy is actually the person. So if I'm not attending, but I'm sending my sister to attend as my proxy, she is the proxy, not the form. And so my sister, has to be at the meeting in order to exercise my vote on my behalf. So the proxy is not an absentee ballot, ballot and the Strata Property Act really makes no provisions for absentee ballots or proxy ballots. Okay, so what you can do with proxies, so you can allow uh, for an owner to grant their proxy, full proxy power. So if, um, let's say again, I'll use my sister as an example, if I wanted to, if I couldn't attend the meeting and I wanted my sister to attend, um, I can give her full power so she can propose amendments and she can participate on, in the discussion. Um, I, you can allow an, an owner to freely choose their proxy. So I have, should be allowed to pick my sister as a proxy holder, even if she is not a person who resides in the building, or even if she is not a person who's on the council. And while it is still permissible for the proxy form, like let's say the Strata Corporation does include a blank proxy form in the AGM package, um, package it is, you, the, the council can still list council members as persons to suggest to hold the proxy, but it still has to provide space for the owner to select someone of their own choosing. So it can't either by implication or outright make it seem like the, they can only choose certain people to hold their proxy. Um, do accept a proxy that is signed by hand or digitally by the owner who's designating the proxy. And so that, you know, so that means it's, it's okay if, as long as it's signed, it's okay if, for the proxy for them not to actually have it on a piece of paper. It could be in an email at, at, attached as a document in an email. It could be attached as a document in a text. Um, it doesn't have to be in, on uh, a, an actual piece of paper. It can be, um, again, uh, uh, on an uh, electronic piece of paper, so to say, in an electronic document. So the Strata Corporation's responsibility in relation to proxies is to allow for a proxy to attend. It is up to the owner to determine whether to restrict or direct the proxy. So that's really important um, to understand because I think a lot of times uh, there is this idea that somehow the proxies have to be policed. So, and that is not correct. It, really, the Strata Corporation just has to, um, it, 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 we'll talk about what the Strata Corporation's responsibility is with respect to certification, but it's really the owner that determines what to restrict and how to direct the proxy. The electronic general meeting has to allow for the proxy to participate as if they were the owner, just like you would in an in-person meeting. Um, and once the proxy form has been certified at the start of the meeting, the proxy form should be given back to the proxy. It is not the Strata Corporation's duty to ensure the proxy is voting or acting in accordance with the directions on the proxy form, right? Because you're normally giving back the proxy form, so they don't have to. And I know um, lots of people um, get a little upset or are concerned about this aspect. But remember, when the proxy form is signed, which could have been, you know, 10 days ago, it is entirely possible that the proxy um, giver, the owner, has now given entirely different directions, but didn't need, feel the need to sign a new proxy form because they don't have to. Um, all they have to do is um, so have the proxy form signed so that the Strata Corporation, when they're certified the proxy, knows who is the proxy, who is, who is going to be the person holding the proxy and doing the voting, and who is the person who's granting the proxy. When conducting general meetings, the person certifying the proxy has to be able to view the signed proxy form. So I've seen this done um, by people holding a piece of paper 
up in front of the camera. And it just means that you have to be able to hold it really still um, so that people can read it. Uh, and your camera, and you, you sometimes have to do it quite close up. You can, if that doesn't work uh, or they don't have a camera, uh, then you can text it or email a picture of it. Um, so any way that you can um, make sure that the person has, the person who's certifying proxies has uh, the ability to, to check the proxy form to make sure that it is com uh, com filled in completely. A proxy must be allowed full proxy power, such as proposing and voting on amendments, if permitted by the owner. And remember, the Strata Corporation is not responsible for ensuring the proxy acts as directed. The owner must ensure the proxy is prepared and educated on the possibility of further voting. And so you get, I'll get that actually, that question quite a bit. What if we amend, uh, we, we make any amendments, how is, how should the proxy vote? And while that is really an issue between the proxy holder, the person who's doing the voting on behalf of the person who granted the proxy. And um, for the most, uh, and that can become a really big issue, for example, at an AGM where you can amend the budget and you can amend the budget quite dramatically um, if necessary. And so it is really important for the proxy giver to give some pretty clear instructions to the proxy to the proxy, to the person who's going to be doing the voting at the meeting, uh, so that they understand um, what to do in the event uh, things like an amendment to the budget happens. Uh, when deciding how to run an electronic meeting, try and recreate an in-person meeting in an online setting. So the same bylaws and provisions of the Act apply to both. So as much as possible, it's really you're just thinking through, yeah, if this was in person, how would we do it? And how does that same thing, how do we make that happen in an electronic format? Um, and if you do that, uh, rather than trying to change it completely, uh, then you are well on your way to making sure that you're uh, in compliance with the act and the bylaws. Okay, Veronica, so I've got a great question for you <clears throat> that comes up almost at most meetings. Um, but the question is, who is actually the person with authority that can certify proxies. And, and my experience has always been um, that we go back and we ask, where do we get the authority from? Um, and it would be the chairperson, the, um, whether that's the elected the president or vice president of council or a person is elected as chair, because we've seen quite a number of complaints in the last months over people doing registration that are actually declaring certain proxies are invalid, but it's not the chairperson who's actually making this decision. And there's no record of it at the meeting, which is a bigger problem. Yeah, it's it's one of the, I think people have become more um, strict about proxies, and which is actually, I think a good thing because I think we've been a bit lax on proxies. And I say this because, um, in in pre-pandemic, I would go to a meeting. They'd uh, they it's a contentious meeting, and they'd want me at the table to help them out with proxy certification. And they turned to me, and for example, the proxy form that the person hands in doesn't specify the proxy's name. It will be blank. You know, it'll be signed. It'll say which units from. It's all completely filled out except it doesn't have that person's name or it only has that person's first name and their first name is John and there are 10 Johns that live in the building. And so, you know, I think in the past, um, because people don't like conflict, they would just oftentimes just accept the proxy form, but that isn't technically a valid proxy because right. it doesn't, it's not completely filled out and it doesn't specify who the proxy, who the proxy actually is. And so again, I think this has sort of brought it to the forefront. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you, when we were doing registrations before um, the pandemic, you often would see a registration table. There would often be a lot of different people at the table um, to help with the registration, but where there is any issue with respect to proxies, it really should go to the chair to make the final determination on, uh, on what, whether that proxy was certified or not. And um, 
you'll you'll want to record it because if the person challenges it down the road, you'll want to know exactly why the proxy form was not accepted as valid. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, I, I chair a huge number of meetings, as many of our staff do. And this is often an issue that comes up where we will get the quorum report with the number of proxies. Um, and we've, we've also gotten into the practice now, which we have historically, of um, having to review the proxies to ensure that they are in fact certified. And if any were, if any were denied or anybody's voting rights were compromised, um, we scrutinize that closely to determine is that accurate? Um, you know, on, on the surface, you know, if they meet the test, they, their name of the owner, the unit number, the name of the person assigned and they're signed um, digitally or um, in writing either way, um, that, that's pretty much close to the limit. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, also, it, it's also a problem where, where we've had um, uh, management companies move to impose, you know, I hate to use the word because we get we, because we don't want to perpetuate it, but restricted proxy meetings um, uh, and appointing just one person as a proxy, which creates all kinds of problems for the for the corporation and for the voters. So it you know it it devolves to an assumption of a of a of an absentee ballot that simply does not exist, which which of course is the ongoing issue. We did we did have a six week window last year where there was nothing anybody could do but issue proxies. There, there weren't electronic meetings. We were under quarantine. Nobody could attend anything. People had sent out notices. Unfortunately, that dragged into the rest of the year as people were getting used to normal electronic meetings. So, um, uh, so uh, another question with respect to proxies um, is, um, um, and again, for records, is it inappropriate for the Strata Corporation to retain a copy of the proxies? So we're doing electronic meetings. We're getting them all by copy anyhow. So, you know, we're not destroying them at the end of the meeting. For the record, if there was a challenge or an issue, is it, is it appropriate or acceptable for the Strata Corporation to retain copies of the proxies? Well, if they're, if they're already receiving them, I mean, I think mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they've come... If they're receiving it, there is definitely a question as to whether the receipt of them is, especially if they're receiving them attached to an email as opposed to just a dropping off. If like that, if that, there's like, I think a few different ways of, uh, it could happen. So if you're dropping off a proxy in the mailbox, a proxy form in the mailbox, um, in the physical mailbox of the Strata Corporation, then technically, um, and you're appointing one of the council members as a proxy, as a proxy, then arguably it's just the document, the proxy, like the proxy document that you would normally give yeah. um, if you just went to their door. So that's not that's not really necessarily giving it to the Strata Corporation. But in a lot of these uh, electronic meetings, for organizational purposes, the Strata Corporation has asked for in their notice package to submit the proxy um, by email beforehand. And once you've submitted it by email beforehand, there's a argument that that email is now correspondence and now as correspondence you're going to have to keep a copy of um, that that becomes a, a strata corporation record that you have to keep um, in accordance with section 35 of the act and you'll have to disclose upon request under section 36 of the act so there is that um, that that issue that comes up when it comes to uh, providing copies of the proxies to the Strata Corporation ahead of time. So a question um, that um, came up with respect to nominations, but I think both you and Adrian um, would, um, would have input on this because I think that the, the question relates to the, the kind of the historic practice of instructions on a proxy where the form I says any voting instructions and what Stratas have been doing is they put their four or five resolutions, then they put a nomination list for council. And so the difficulty with that is, um, is that they, you know, there's a nomination of five or six people. Um, they pre kind of pre-screened or pre-qualified or, you know, pre-coerced a bunch of people to be on council this year. Um, and the difficulty is you've got all these proxies gathered and you've got these, these designated uh, or nominated people for council who still get who still get nominated to the meeting but the difficulty is you've got all these advanced instructions now you have three or four more people get nominated at the AGM who 
who don't have the privilege of that advance notice with those proxies. And so the likelihood of them getting voted, even if they are great council members or great candidates, unless the proxy holders are prepared to just vote for them, um, diminishes greatly. They, you know, they're, they're prejudiced almost out of the gate. They, and I've seen this at many meetings, the chances of them getting elected are almost zero. Yeah, although I've been to a meeting where somebody who had um, shown up to be nominated also brought in enough proxies to make sure they got nominated. They got elected. <laughs> Which is good for them. <laughs> yeah, it was good for them. <laughs> um. <laughs> you know, so, so, but, you know, I guess, I guess, Adrian, the advanced question is, is it okay for us to distribute an advanced nomination list of council members? Well, um, in my view, I think you need to look at the bylaws. Is it permitted by the bylaws? Is there, is there a nomination process? And I have seen a strata that set up quite a, quite a detailed nomination process um, for council members. And if that's the process and that's in the bylaws, then I think that's one thing. If we're making it up as we go along and we decided that we're just going to canvas some owners and see who wants to run and put their names in the um, AGM notice and in the proxy form, um, I guess I question whether that wouldn't be significantly unfair and whether that isn't um, really a, a method of preventing legitimate individuals who are who are individuals who are legitimately entitled to be on council from realistically um, being elected. Now I've searched the CRT decisions and well I've seen that happen. I haven't actually seen the CRT indicate one way or the other. Veronica, I don't know if you have, but uh, nothing that I read um, it says, no, this shouldn't be done. In a couple cases it was done, but the owner didn't really challenge it. So they just sort of put it aside. Um, my recommendation would be that unless you've got a bylaw, you don't include the names in the, in the proxy or in the notice of the meeting. No, just I agree. That, it just, it, it create, it's too likely that you'll create unfairness, even inadvertently. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't do that at an in-person meeting, so why, why do it at an electronic meeting? Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally agree too. It, it, it does create an imbalance. Um, uh, so this is a little off topic, but it refers to council members. So I think it's actually a good topic uh, and we've never really dealt with it in the forum. Um, and it's a, it's a great question because we're seeing this now being imposed by management companies where they are, they are demanding that strata council members sign a, a code of ethics and a non-disclosure agreement um, to um, act on council. So the new council is elected, first council meeting, they're presented with these disclosures and required to sign them. So not in the bylaws, not an agreement of strata council, where does this stuff come from? Well, in my view, um, it doesn't come from anywhere. And this, the let's step back. Who's the strata manager? The strata manager is the agent of the strata corporation. The strata manager takes instruction and direction from the strata council. The strata manager may guide and assist the strata council. They may provide um, their experiences, the business best business practices that they've picked up over the years. But it's not for the strata manager to say that this must be done unless it's a term of the contract. And if there's a contract that the strata has signed that says that we will not manage your strata unless each strata council member that's elected signs this document, well, then the, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the validity of that. But if that hasn't, if that is not in the contract, then I don't see any basis for a strata manager to insist that a strata council member sign anything. Having said that, what the strata manager is proposing may actually be a very good idea. But the process isn't to require the strata council to sign it, but rather to propose to the strata council that it approve it as a policy and encourage its members to sign it. Veronica, you want to weigh in or are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it's hard to say. It may be one of those, and that's the difficulty, I think, with having a, a policy because oftentimes it's not written anywhere. 
And if they haven't done a good job of putting it in the minutes that they've adopted this policy, which is probably what they should do, um, it may be that the strata manager is just continuing something that had happened in a previous year, um, and we don't know. Um, but yeah, I agree entirely with Adrian. Like unless um, unless it's uh, like unless you have some sort of policy, it's really up to the strata council to decide. Um, whether they're going to have this or not, or whether they're going to sign this or not. So here's the age old question that we get probably every week. Can the Strata Corporation restrict the number of proxies a person can hold? <laughs> Are we beyond that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, but you know, in fairness, there are new owners and new owners to Strata and uh, this, this may be their very first meeting and if it is welcome, but the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, it, I know that it, it often feels unfair because somebody has gone out and, and, you know, gone out and gotten 50 proxies, but at the end of the day, you can go out and get 50 proxies as well, right? It's, it's entirely possible to go if there is an issue that is really important to you um, and you want there is a mandate it is entirely possible for you to use it it's a democratic process um, in order to affect change well and we have many buildings where we'll have an owner who owns 5 10 15 or 20 units as an investor and if the strata corporation restricted the number of proxies how is that person going to be fairly represented there are so many reasons why the answer is no, that we probably don't have enough time during a webinar to cover it. That's right, it's just, it's just no, it's just, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. actually that has been determined by um, a CRT decision, I believe, yeah. if not a court decision. So <laughs> it isn't, it, no room for debate any longer. Uh, another question that, I, I, this is more related to meetings and the role of the chairperson, but, um, uh, and, and we see this quite commonly, um, and, and the definition is nowhere to be found in the act, but it's where the um, president of council decides they don't want to chair the meeting, they don't want to elect anybody else, but they appoint the property manager as the facilitator of the meeting. Um, we have no definition called a facilitator in bylaws um, or within the act. Um, and so the, the complication becomes who is actually chairing the meeting and how is that reported? And what role of authority does that person have? Um, we see this more and more now. Um, and it's and it's often because of the reluctance of the president of council, who's just not comfortable in managing the meetings themselves. So, you know, um, how do you think strata corporations get around this with respect to, you know, officially appointing a chairperson? My, my, my experience is just elect the property manager to chair your meeting or elect someone else to chair the meeting or default to the vice president. Uh, don't try to create these two positions that are going to create complications during the meeting. Yeah, or amend your bylaws. Because some bylaws I think prohibit uh, anybody other than eligible voters to Correct. be, um, to be uh, chairs of the meeting. And if that's the case and you don't like that <laughs> and you've got people who are not willing to to actually chair because they're you know shy or reluctant or don't know how to do it then yeah amend your bylaws to allow for it i've actually seen a couple meetings with the strata manager acting as the facilitator but the strata manager in that case um I'll, and i agree there's nothing there's nothing in the bylaws that can't contemplate a facilitator, but then there's a number of things that happen in, in a meeting that um, may not actually be contemplated. But in the case that, a couple cases that I've been at, the decisions were still made by the chair. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've got the process down and you understand, I'm facilitating because I've got some sense of parliamentary procedure. So I'll ask for the motion, um, I'll call for the question, but if there's any sort of issue anything that needs to be decided, anything that's a matter of the business of the strata, that's for the chair to decide. And if we could do that, um, then I don't, see, I don't see that it would be a problem. But 
Um, and you may not want the strata manager. And in that kind of case, you may not want the strata manager chairing because then the strata manager is going to be making decisions that are actually decisions that perhaps should be made by the, the council itself. Um, but I think if you if you've got a facilitator who's effectively the chair and is making those decisions, I think you're subject to challenge in terms of the validity of the meeting. All right, one last question. And this, this one here goes to election of council, but also procedure at the meeting. So the um, Strata Corporation elect, elected um, uh, their maximum of seven, but there was a tie for the seventh position. So what is their option? There's um, knowing that the is the is this the president of council who is the also the chairperson at the time um, do they get an additional casting ballot to break the tie or is this best put back to the owners for a runoff for diplomatic reasons so they, the big question is does the additional casting ballot of the chair per, of the president apply in the majority vote situation So it's a good question as everybody's scrambling for their standard bylaws in the legislature. Well, it, it, it is, and that's exactly it, Tony. Um, why don't you tell everyone what the provision is in relating to relation to a council member's tying um, vote to break a tie? And so let's just read that out so everyone has it. Uh, well, a, the president or vice president in the event of a um, tie ballot has an additional casting ballot What's the section of the act? Um, it's two parts. It's both under the bylaw and under the act. Uh, it was uh, this was actually this was actually an amendment that occurred a few years ago to create the additional vote um, at um, at general meetings because it wasn't actually created originally um, under our legislation. Come on, somebody has it. Quick, 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 quick. Well, standard bylaw 27 says, if there's a tie vote in an annual or special general meeting, the president or if the president is absent, the vice president can break the tie by casting a second deciding vote. So that's all. That's I, always that's, been. That's basically it, yes. Part of the bylaws. So um, if there is a tie vote, is this a tie vote per se? So that's the first thing you have to ask, right? It's also section 53 of the act. Okay. The section 53 sub four was added a few years ago, uh, which also says if there's a tie vote at an annual or special general meeting, president or vice president um, is absent or unwilling, the vice president may break the tie by casting a second deciding vote. So it basically mirrors what the bylaws say. It just re it restates the bylaws. So I think yeah. the first question is, is this um, a tie vote when we're talking about two individuals? I mean, my, my sense would be um, for diplomatic and um, all sorts of reasons, we put it back to a runoff between the two. But um, I think there's an argument that the chair could make the, could make the decision. Veronica, where are you at on this? Yeah, I, I feel like it would be a tie vote because I'm just trying to think of what if it wasn't the president? What if it was just two individuals who were running for council and um, they ended up with the tie? Um, I think that would that would allow for it. But I agree with you. I think if I were the president, the, the bylaws already have a provision that allow either the vice president to go um, and make the decision or to just say, you know what, given that I am the president, um, let's make this clean and let's just have a runoff vote between the two of us. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I think so. Take, take the diplomatic road, avoid the conflict. Yeah. Tony, this is you're, well, you're not going to, you're less likely to be challenged that way, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the thing, again, as I said at the beginning, when we get to this point in the meeting, people are tired, people are going to start to to take issue. Um, one of the things that I, a question I did see is whether we can establish voting or 
number thresholds for non-resident owners in the bylaws. And I think um, that sort of concerns me because uh, I think that there are strata councils out there that truly distinguish and have an us and them attitude with people who are renting and people who are not residing in their strata lot. And in my view, the strata corporation cannot create ineligibility provisions within their bylaws. The Act provides one way that an owner can be ineligible um, to run for council if the bylaws have amended, been amended, and that is if the strata can file a lien. But um, I'm very concerned about stratas that try and restrict who else can be on council because I think the Act is very clear that if you're an owner, a registered owner, you're eligible to be on council and there's no provision in the Act, in my view, that the strata council can restrict that. So be careful with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're past time and I know people are going to start leaving because they're going back to work and all those great things. So um, Adrian, um, Veronica, thank you so very much. We have um, one more little, there we are, one more little screen for you. So you have to add your photos and your email addresses. I'll leave this up for a few moments for everyone. If you have questions, please feel free to email Adrian or Veronica or any one of our advisors and we'll be happy to research the information for you and, and help you out. Um, I've consolidated lots of questions together so we can capture as much information as possible. Great session. Thank you so very much. And um, we'll hope to see you soon live and in person. I hope that's the plan. So Let's hope so. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.